passengers who were earning a livelihood and those who were unemployed, children and so on and so forth. Various categories were formed and this money was paid. I, I think that that would be the precedent for what would be asked of Iran. I have an idea, again, I'm trying to cover the ground as much as I can. Uh, and according to the information I have, uh, the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran has deposits, foreign exchange deposits of about 100 billion. Uh, but much of this money is not uh, accessible because of the sanctions that have been imposed. Uh, one calculation, and I think it's a calculation that uh, uh, the American person responsible for uh, uh, Iran policy, Brian Hook, has said is perhaps 10 billion is what is available to them. But I'm sure that in this particular case, uh, that money, which is not accessible now, will become accessible because I think the Iranian government will, uh, will uh, argue that since we have to make these, these payments, those accounts that have been frozen must be unfrozen to the extent that we can make that payment here. Uh, how this works out is something that uh, has, has to be has offered. Uh, in a sense, uh, the fact that uh, there will be uh, uh, compensation or there will be reparations or there will be actions will be taken and to my mind the precedent of uh, 1988 will apply. So having gotten that out of the way I'd like to try and focus on the three countries primarily uh, associated with these recent developments, the United States of America, uh, Iran and Iraq. These are the three countries that have been most directly affected and I'd like to start with the United States. In the United States, uh, there is much confusion. There's so much confusion that uh, uh, Pompeo says that I cannot talk about what, is, uh, what actions were, uh, were being planned and for which we made the attack on uh, Commander Qasim uh, uh, Soleimani. Uh, but the attack was imminent. About five minutes later, well, five minutes may be an exaggeration, but uh, within the arm, uh, President Trump said they were going to attack four embassies, embassy of, uh, in Baghdad and three others. He didn't specify which others, but he's, this he specified. Now, obviously, if Pompeo was leading the charge and that this was known, uh, why it was not disclosed to Congress, why it was not uh, mentioned is something that suggests that uh, polarization of the country includes a great deal of confusion within the administration itself. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, that from Iraq's perspective, for instance, they received a letter saying that they are going to reposition the forces uh, so that uh, uh, they can be withdrawn. We honor your request and we're going to do this. And then you had uh, the Secretary of Defense and uh, the Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff of America declare that this was only a draft, this was never meant to be circulated. And Ali Mali, the uh, uh, acting Prime Minister right now in Iraq, says, look, we've, we've got an official letter and we would like to treat that letter as being something that has value. Uh, but again, uh, what I'm, uh, why I'm giving you this example is the confusion that prevails there. In 1978, President Ford, after a number of botched attempts at killing uh, leaders, uh, he said that assassination is now illegal. Any American who undertakes, uh, undertakes an assassination will be punished. Unfortunately, he did not define assassination. And so this is the legal question that is now being examined. Much of the, what you hear from uh, the experts, uh, legal experts, is that look, there is very little uh, way, uh, common understanding this is uh, 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 an assassination. Because you are not at war with Iran and you have hit one of their principal commanders. But 
In legal terms, maybe there's an argument to be made. Right now, my uh, reading suggests that many of the legal experts in America are prepared to term this an assassination both in legal terms, in common sense terms, but also in legal terms. How this debate will re resolve itself remains open to question. Now, uh, why, do, why do I emphasize this? Because the United States uh, thinks of itself as a nation of rule, or nation of laws, and that if a law has been breached, then somebody has to uh, pay the penalty for doing so. So this is going to be a long debate, but it is also going to be part of the polarization of American society. Right now, uh, the uh, House has passed by 204 to 194 a uh, resolution saying that you have exceeded your powers and f as of now, the War Powers Act, you cannot, you cannot take action against Iran. The authority for waging war lies with Congress and not with uh, the President. President Trump is going to ignore it. A, because in the Senate he knows that this will never pass, such a resolution will never pass, and even if, because the Senate is right now 53 <coughs> Republican Senators. Two of them have indicated, perhaps even three will indicate that they will not uh, go along with President Trump and may vote because this is a question of the legislative body being able to exercise the authority under the Constitution. I'm sorry I'm going into these details because I think it's necessary for uh, to understand uh, where the the nation of laws and rules has uh, come to, what point it has come to. Because under these rules, again, even if the Senate does uh, pass this, uh, the President has the authority to veto it, and there is no way in which the, a two-third majority, uh, which would be required in the Senate, uh, can uh, then uh, overcome uh, the presidential veto. So, this will apply. And the question of assassination will remain a question of that will be debated back and forth, but will not uh, come to any conclusion. Uh, the United States polarization is going to continue to impact because that polarization also includes, uh, uh, to put it mildly, uh, President Trump's unpredictability. But one, one thing is predictable. Anything that President Obama did was bad, and anything that President Obama did had to be reversed. Uh, many people are now arguing with him and arguing in, uh, in the media with the fact that perhaps if we are to get out of this difficult situation, reinstate the JCPOA, the Joint uh, Coordinated Plan of Action, uh, to which Russia, China, uh, the United States of America, and uh, the, the Europeans or all party, so that you can talk about the story. Now, again, in this respect, uh, if there is a sense of betrayal in uh, Iran, it's understandable because it was in fact Commander uh, Suleiman uh, who uh, had uh, led the delegation uh, in, uh, well not led, but was part of the Iranian delegation when uh, the question of uh, the Bonn conference uh, was being, uh, in the Bonn conference, the United States was seeking Iran's assistance and trying to resolve uh, the problem of setting up a government in, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, and as a result of which President Karzai became president. And there was a strong sense of betrayal because shortly after that, uh, Iran was made part of the axis of evil. To my mind, President Trump has a view of Iran, but there is a deeper, deeper concern. And I think that the American people, or at least what you would call the American secret state, if you will, or the administrative control uh, that is exercised, is still traumatized by the hostage crisis. It is, it is driving the 
attitude towards Iran, uh, which attitude I think uh, made it difficult for them, even in the early years when President Rafsanjani made overtures uh, to, to respond positively. Uh, the story of Mike Fallon and the cake I will not repeat, but these are all incidents in which overtures were made and then overtures were rejected. And I think that this has become part of the American psyche. Uh, they talk about the fact that we don't forget and we don't forgive. And I think partly that hostage crisis remains a, a big factor in this particular thing. Pragmatism is not necessarily what is happening right now. Uh, many people have argued against, against this. Uh, two of the principal think tanks in America including the uh, think tank the CSIS has written stories about how this is counterproductive and I like the phrase he used, he says America's principal enemy in the Middle East is America itself uh, and that more damage has been done to American interests in, in the Middle East by American policies than by anything that anybody else has done. This is not the prevailing sentiment. The prevailing sentiment is that what happened to Commander Qasem Soleimani was right, uh, but now de escalated. And then you see a sequence of events. Uh, they start with the fact that immediately after 3rd January, uh, the stories are we want de escalation. Then there is a period in which all the stories are that we have to take further action. Then, on the 7th of January, the tone changes again. And that tone changes because the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, all of them have made overtures to, to America and said, no, de-escalation is what we want. And thereafter, the press media statements that are issued by the State Department all talk about wanting de-escalation. And President Trump, uh, sees uh, it fit to endorse that particular fact that now if uh, the Iran is, uh, has done what it did and uh, Iran says that that is all we intend doing, we will de-escalate. Now this is a position that I think has been reached largely on the American side by the fact that uh, all their allies or all those who are dependent on them. Incidentally, I think uh, I might mention here that the amount of arms that America has sold to uh, this area, to the GCC countries, is uh, 48, 000, 48 billion, of which 46 billion is the GCC countries. Then there is a little bit for Jordan, a little bit for Egypt, etc., etc. But what uh, uh, is spent by uh, Iran on defense. Uh, according to both uh, parties, that is, uh, two uh, people who do this work, which is uh, the Institute of International uh, Strategic uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies and the CIPRI, uh, the Stockholm uh, Institute of uh, Policy Research. Uh, according to them, uh, this is in 2016. The total arms sales was uh, two, uh, 5 billion and from 2017 to 2019 October the sales were 48 billion. So it's been a multiple of the uh, assistance that had been given them. And Iran's expenditure during this time has been about 15 billion again according to these figures. So uh, the defense expenditure of Iran has been 15 billion. So, uh, in, and of course there are tables which show exactly how much uh, uh, Iran has by way of uh, hardware on the ground and how much is uh, elsewhere. Sanctions that uh, Trump has now introduced are really uh, more of a face saving than anything else because he had already talked about uh, uh, the fact that steel and metal products are sanctioned. Now he's added another layer which makes really very little difference. He is also named uh, Admiral Shankani and uh, 
uh, other uh, leaders in Iran uh, sanctioned with absolutely nothing except symbolic value because these people are not traveling to the United States and certainly do not have bank accounts that can be frozen within reach of the United States. So let me say that right now uh, confusion will continue to prevail in the United States as part of the impeachment process, as part of the process of uh, uh, the democratic effort to try and regain for the legislative branch the authority uh, to uh, wage war which the constitution provides. Let me turn now to, to Iran. I think uh, if I might, uh, and subject to uh, modification that uh, the Honorable Consul General might have in mind, uh, Iran took a wise step of announcing that we have carried out our attack and that is all we can do. But I think they were also conveying a message, apart from the fact that, look, we are not going to do anything further at this particular time. And that message was, please examine the precision of our missiles. This attack was, took place in an area in which the popular mobilization front forces of uh, Iraq were present. Uh, there was they had warned the uh, popular mobilization front that separate yourself as far as possible from uh, the American forces. But the American forces were really uh, deliberately based so that they were uh, within the uh, reach of the popular mobilization front, whom they regarded as, uh, as allies. And uh, I think the message was that please see that we are capable of damaging only what we want to damage. This, the first statements were that 80 people have been killed, 800 people have been killed, but that was subsequently modified and said we deliberately chose to avoid creating any law. But the fact is that in Iran, uh, there were nationwide protests as a result of the gasoline prices, and those protests had acquired a certain intensity. But Commander uh, Qasem Soleimani's death brought the nation together. In that sense, it was very really counterproductive from the American perspective, but it was, uh, if I may say so, a relief for the uh, regime in, in, uh, in Tehran because all the people came together and said, our hero has been martyred and we are at one with our government. This was uh, one of the results that I think Trump's people did not, have, Trump himself did not anticipate. But there is an underlying problem, and that problem is that uh, the economic situation has deteriorated. The, the IMF and the World Bank think that the economy has shrunk by 10 to 12 percent. The uh, Brian Hook, the Americans, feel that the uh, contraction in the economy has been 15% plus. There is no doubt that there is enormous suffering and there is, in my, to my mind, no doubt that some of the protesters who were out there were saying, don't spend the money elsewhere, spend it in, 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 in Iran. We need that to ease the, the problems that we have. We have problems of water, we have other problems and we need to be focused on this. Now, how long, how long this uh, particular uh, event, and it was a catastrophic event of uh, uh, Commander Qasem Soleimani's death, how long the impact will remain, and how much this will act as a, the glue that holds the Iranian nation together, is a question that needs to be answered because of the possible economic distress uh, that is being felt right now and which will continue for some time. So Iran, I think, has made a conscious decision that we will not do anything for the moment. And I think that they have advised their uh, adherents and their supporters uh, throughout, from in Syria, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, in uh, Bahrain, and elsewhere, that please 
keep the peace at this particular time. Now, how long this is going to last, I cannot say, because Imam Khamenei has talked about the fact that uh, there will be, that we will administer the slap uh, on uh, uh, the American fleets, but we will not be satisfied until they are removed from the, the region. Uh, now, removing from the region, my own reading is that in a probability, uh, the Americans have at the moment about somewhere between 45 and 55,000 uh, troops in this area, and of them, <coughs> the latest addition was 4,500 who were sent to Kuwait. I have a feeling that these 4,500 will be redeployed back and they will leave the region. Uh, and perhaps uh, Trump may be persuaded that, look, our real problem is in uh, Southeast Asia and we need to deploy there more effectively. Whether this happens or not, I don't know. But that seems to be something that is on the plate. Lastly, uh, let me turn to, to Iraq. Iraq has uh, become the battleground. And I think that the riots that took place uh, in, uh, Iran, uh, in Iraq were genuinely aimed at two things. One, the uh, kleptocracy or uh, corruption of the government, the, the leaders in power, and the second, the feeling that Iran had gained a degree of influence which was far higher uh, than was comfortable for Iran. There is also, in my view, I had, uh, I served in Iraq for, uh, for four years and I got to know the people, they are a lovely people, uh, but I got the feeling uh, that there was a sense both of the fact that there is corruption and inefficiency and kleptocracy in the, in the government, current government, but there was also this that there is an overweening Iranian presence or Iranian influence. And uh, Arab Ajam is something that has existed for many years. And that factor was beginning to surface. After all, between 1979 and 87, uh, it was Iraqi Shiites who were the majority in the army, and they were the ones who fought or tried to advance uh, into into Iran. So, is that is that Arab feeling returning to the point where the closeness uh, of uh, religion is being set aside? and the old arab ajam relationship uh, is coming to the surface again. This is something that one has to, uh, to look at, but certainly at the moment it seems that the Arabness of Iraq is uh, wanting to assert itself and finds itself in a difficult position of having, in, in fact, become the battleground for, uh, between Iran and Iraq. So I will, uh, uh, with this short uh, sort of remarks on these three uh, countries and I'm not going to talk about Jordan or talk about what is happening in the rest of the Arab world apart from the fact that Libya is a mess and Libya is a mess because there are Arab countries on one side and there are Arab countries on the other side, there are the Russians there, uh, there are the Turks there, uh, Algeria is another difficult situation. So it is throughout the, the Muslim world, unfortunately, through the Arab Muslim world, if I might put it this, this way. And in each of them, one factor stands out, that as this turmoil increases, there will be more room for ISIS, for Daesh. And I think that you are seeing a resurgence of Daesh, despite the fact that they do not hold territory anymore. This is, should be a source of concern. We have now reports uh, in terms of Pakistan that the uh, Awans are saying that we have Daesh members of the TTP who will be able to return to Pakistan. I have not been able to check on that more thoroughly, but what I'm trying to say is that Daesh, without holding any territory, is still a, a, a potent force and a destructive force for the Islamic, uh, for the Muslim world. 
Unfortunately, uh, the divisions within the uh, Muslim world are such that there is no united effort at trying to curb them. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it's been longer than I intended, but. It was a pleasure, Rajputi, sir. Mr. Mahmoud. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Distinguished guests. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Ambassador. Ambassador. Masmah Hassan. And assalamu alaikum too. Uh, thanks so much for uh, in inviting me to today to this uh, very good atmosphere uh, discussion. Um, uh, anytime I came here, I was very pleased because the, the, the atmosphere of the library is very enjoyable. Uh, recently, after this revolution in the region, uh, has caused right now we rounding together and discuss about that. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, announce my depth regret about uh, happening in Iran by the human error to uh, shot to the civil aircraft, unfortunately, and uh, that uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, explained that. Uh, our uh, official from the highest rank, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, has announced about that and said about the regret uh, president too, and inshallah we follow, my government follow to find the uh, problem and failure and inshallah to have the con compensation about that. Uh, the, the difference of the, this case that you mentioned about the 1988 uh, problem was that the American in that time maybe announced about the uh, mistake, but unfortunately very soon uh, not only not punished the admiral of that shipment, but also they gave him a sign and medal, and it was very, very strong for the Iranian nation. Inshallah, we see that it's not happened again that this kind of the problem in the country and the region, not only in Iran, in the other country too. It's a tragedy. Unfortunately, uh, 3rd of January, uh, the Sardar Soleimani commander of Iranian has been thrown and assassinated uh, by, uh, by an American drone in the Iraq. Absolutely. Uh, this act is a terrorist act, act because uh, Mr. Soleimani uh, during the assassination was carrying a message to the Iraqi officials. He was not uh, in the war battle. He was in Baghdad and he was carrying a message uh, maybe you heard the Iraqi Prime Minister told uh, in the same day he had a meeting with uh, Mr. Ghassan Soleimani. From the first of the, this action, unfortunately the, 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 the United States uh, has started to present the false causes of death. And uh, this false cause is not only not accepted by the peoples of the region and the world, but also the Congress of the United States cannot be convinced about the, this reason. Uh, I think it is not necessary to discuss uh, about uh, the uh, terrorist act or uh, illegality act of the, this uh, happening uh, because it's very clear. Here is the Institute of, of the International Affairs and I think it's better to uh, talk uh, more about the consequences of the, this kind of the action. I was thinking to uh, divide the consequences of this action to the three uh, category. Uh, uh, one category is the consequences of the internal uh, uh, of the Iranian uh, people and Iranian nation in the domestic of Iran. 
uh, I think the millions of people are in the funeral of the Mr. Bassem Soleimani was very unique and very specific. Maybe we didn't have the, not maybe, absolutely, we didn't have the recent uh, people in the, in the, in the to attending the millions of Iranians, not only in the one, two city, all city of the Iran, for the funeral ceremony, and uh, we didn't have, uh, maybe we didn't have a, in the history that a military man uh, to have the, this kind of the funeral to go to the uh, Atabata Ali at the holy shrines in Iraq, in Mashhad, in Qom, and in the many cities. It's very specific and unique. Uh, this cause, I think, uh, one of the very important consequences is the unity of the nation of Iran. And among the people, it was very uh, unity spirit. Not only among the nation, but also we saw the, this kind of the unity among the political groups, among the political elites and uh, leaders. Another consequence uh, is to emphasize uh, that uh, America is not trustable. Uh, you know that maybe in the society of Iran uh, there are the several kind of the thinking. Some of them maybe are encouraged to have to negotiate with the United States and others no. But by the, this kind of the action and you saw the millions of the funeral people comes to the funeral ceremony. They showed the, 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 that America, the United States, is not uh, trustable, and and I think it's died down to have the, any uh, request for the negotiation again. The consequences of the regional. Uh, I think that this uh, miscalculated uh, action of the United States and the lately uh, retaliating act of Iran was it started to finish of the U.S. illegal presence in the region. I think uh, they have to start to to go out from the region because uh, it is uh, the, the, this recent development. It shows uh, the request of the people and the governments in the region is very strongly. You saw the, for example, the approval of the Iraqi parliament, or uh, there were very demonstration from the Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan up to Iraq, Syria. The all of the people in the uh, region, they requested uh, this uh, desire that the uh, United States must, must leave the region. Uh, this uh, action, I think, uh, shows that the United States doesn't have the ability and legitimacy uh, to creating the security in the region. Another consequence is the unity among the Muslims and the countries in the region, in the Middle East and the West Asia. And another consequence in the regional is a strange sending of the terrorism again, unfortunately. You heard uh, ISIS recently welcomed about the assassination of the Mr. Hassan Soleimani, Iranian commander. Unfortunately, uh, if uh, they wanted to terror a commander who fight uh, several years against Daesh, what will be happened about, the, uh, for example, the future of the uh, fighting against Daesh and terrorism in the region? And the third one is the consequences of the the international community. Uh, I think that this uh, development uh, 
shows uh, for the international community too that the United States is not untrustable, is untrustable, and uh, is unpredictable too. The United States, unfortunately, used from the norms and principle uh, as a tool. And uh, any time uh, they request and need for some government or some people, they provide them. And even they didn't, they don't need to have this very easily, they remove him and assassinate him. And it is unbelievable for the international community. And another consequences of the international uh, category is the weakness of the feeling of hegemony of the United States. As you know, that after the uh, World War II, it was the first time that uh, one American military base has been attacked by the missile by the other country. It didn't occur before. Right now, I think it's very necessary. We have to know uh, the region might provide the security of the region. The all of the neighbor country must have the unity and cooperate together to provide the, their own security. Security of the region is not as a commodity to buy or sell. Security might, must be created and established by the integration, by the cooperation. And uh, maybe you heard that recently, last week, we had a conference in Tehran about uh, uh, hormones, uh, peace of hormones initial that uh, has held in Tehran. It was very important, and you can follow up in the news about that. My means is that, that all of the country in the region must to have that alliance, to have the integration, to create their own security. It's not possible to buy or sell the security. The countries in the region may be now, right now, very well, that the America and the United States cannot provide their own security. How can it happened to the U.S. want to provide the other country security too. It happened in the, some months ago to attacking to a drone of the United States and uh, in the, some shipment in the Persian Gulf. It's very good shows about that the United States cannot provide their own security in the region. How they can want to provide and to guarantee the other countries' security. The, all the countries in the region must create their own security. Uh, the, the another uh, subject of the region, uh, what to do, is the ne neutrality. I myself believe the neutrality is, doesn't have the benefit for the region because the neutrality usually St uh, strong and strange sending of the unilateral unilateralism. If the whole of the country in the region wanted to be divided, that this kind of the imposing might be happened for them too. <coughs> the, the other. The other category of the, what to do about the, this uh, recent development is the international community. International community must not allow to any country that use of the norms and principle uh, as a tool. International community must uh, start to work to that uh, not allowed to the 
any country that they want to easily violate of the norm and the principle of the United Nations. The all of the country might be accept the responsibility. International community must say to the some country that they have the colonial spirit that the 19th century has been finished and right now we are in the 21st century and the all of the playing role has been changed if it happened i believe the international organizations and the united nations uh, will be more strange and it's have very benefit for the international community and the last one about the what to do about the U.S. The U.S. M must accept to respect the, to the all of the country and the nation at the world and in the region too. Unfortunately, but by miscalculated to face with the other country, usually they are following to impose their wants to the other country, and it is not uh, right. It's completely accept, uh, completely mistake. U.S. must uh, finish the illegal presence in the region. After 20 years of the presence in the region, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in South Syria, what, what, what's happened? Not only there is uh, not solo the security problem, but also they created more and more and the, the they promote that they promoted the tourism what's happened about the production of the drug in the region after 20 years of the presence of the foreign allies in the afghanistan and in final uh, i have to say uh, the iran has now the negotiation that we had before Joint Comprehensive Action of Plan, uh, our uh, nuclear program with the five plus one country. We had that, but unfortunately, U.S. left. We know very well uh, negotiation. And we have the military power to defend on ourselves too. Right now, it's Trump and President Trump and U.S. have to choose which one is more prior for them? Thanks so much. Thank you, Mohamed Isam. That's a name. Thank you, Dr. Masuma, for giving me an opportunity to talk at this August forum. Uh, I'm a very humble student of uh, Iran and a very humble student of revolution and uh, I mean Iran has a special place in my heart because the revolution and I are roughly the same age uh, you know we were born in the same year so uh, you know and, and January for some reason has a very special place in Iranian history it was in January in the days of January that the Shah of Iran fled uh, what was going to be his last uh, uh, this, uh, you know, trip, uh, you know, he fled, uh, you know, in, in the January of 1979, and it was in January, one year later, that the Iranian hostage crisis was also uh, winding up or down, uh, and now we are in 2020, and it is in January that we are yet again in the throes of another uh, crisis which uh, involves um, Iran. Um, so I will be talking about uh, contemporary concerns and I will also be working my way back uh, to uh, uh, you know Iranian history because uh, you know what is going on today has parallels in what was going on in the last 40 years. So basically what we are seeing in Iran is the unraveling of this so-called Trump doctrine of maximum pressure. You know, that's what he said when he came to power in that he's going to exert a maximum pressure on Iran. And what we are seeing now 
uh, from Iran. Uh, basically, uh, it's the un from the United States, it's an unraveling of the maximum pressure doctrine. And what Iran had been following was the doctrine of strategic patience. So now that has unraveled as well. You know, what has happened in the past two days has been a calibrated response from, from Iran. So, you know, they broke away from their, uh, you know, stated position with the Iranians uh, of strategic patience to a policy of calibrated response. In fact, uh, 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 Mr. Khamenei, right after, uh, you know, the, Iran, the, United, the, the United States struck Qasem Soleimani said that we are going to plot a strategic revenge. Uh, and it's very unfortunate because uh, right now the United States is the most isolated country in terms of the Middle East than it has ever been. In, its, uh, in, in the 40, 50 years since they had diplomatic relations with Iran. They are in a very, very weak position. And um, even more weak, uh, weaker are their allies, you know, people in Riyadh and, 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 and Tel Aviv who probably uh, would, uh, were celebrating a few years ago when the United States uh, withdrew from the Luzon deal, but now there is no celebration in, in, in the Arab capitals, uh, in, the, in, in, in Riyadh and, and, and Tel Aviv. So basically, uh, what I've been trying to understand is how can a person who was carrying a diplomatic passport, General Qasem Soleimani, he was carrying a diplomatic passport, he was traveling from uh, Baghdad, from Beirut to Baghdad on a peace mission. Because the, he had asked, because the United States has asked, had asked Iraq to mediate between Iran and the United States. You know, this is the concatenation of, of events which had been going on since a military contractor was killed in Kirkuk and then they were right, there was writing in Baghdad, the United States embassy was overrun and then again, uh, you know, the United States and, and you know, it was quite dramatic what happened. So it was the United States that was, uh, you know, that had asked uh, General Soleimani, uh, you know, uh, you know, he was a peace uh, and I wanted to actually speak about a specific thing, Council General, that you mentioned. It was about the uh, potential talks. Uh, Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi said that uh, Asim Soleimani was coming. Uh, there was a meeting that was supposed to occur with the Saudis, supposedly, in some uh, sort of olive branch effort. Now, of course, there's a lot of theories going on. Uh, were the Saudis in on the American plan? Were they not in on the American plan? Or, you know, and they pulled, uh, the American school, the Saudis. I don't know what the Iranian position is, but one question is, I guess, I don't know if you're at liberty to share what sort of peace proposal or some sort of normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia, hopefully to help the whole Middle East out, does Iran offering on the table? Maybe just a brief overview of that. And is this olive branch, that, or whatever this negotiation, is it still in play? Will Iran pursue this route with Saudi Arabia? Oh, and if you can answer that, thank you. country that uh, they have uh, disconnecting the uh, political relation with Iran. Since that time, we announced it was uh, our official position. Every time we were ready to have a negotiation, we solved all of the problem. Many times we, uh, the, our president announced our prime uh, minister of foreign affairs, our spokesman in the MOFA. They announced very officially, we are ready to solve the problem. Really, really, we are ready to have discussion with them to solve the problem because really we believe that all of the problem in the region must solve inside of the region, not to come to the other power or other country, bring inside the, country, the, to the region to increase the problem, unfortunately, that you uh, recently you showed, you, you, you saw about that. Thank you. Any other questions? For the Crown Prince to, to plan uh, enemies, to assassinate enemies in Iran. On the other hand, in, in January 2019, the outgoing Israeli uh, chief of army, uh, Eisenhower, questioned the Israeli government why the uh, Qasem Soleimani is alive. So, who benefited from Qasem Soleimani's assassination? Thank you. General Qasem Soleimani was uh, fighting against terrorism and Daesh for several years. It's a question, uh, why they assassinated right now? Why before the collapsing of Daesh, the United States didn't do that? 
because he was successful to collapse the organization of Daesh in the Syria. The U.S. knows very well how many times General Qasem Soleimani saved the American soldiers in the Syria and in Iraq. They know very well. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, just they are accusing him as a terrorist. It's very clearly the first of the group that have the benefit about the assassination of him is the terrorist group such as the ISIS, the United States too, maybe the Israel too, because they are very welcome to this kind of the terrorist action. Thank you. Uh, just uh, to make a slight uh, addition to what has been said, I think uh, when we talk about January 2019, which is what you mentioned, uh, the fact of the matter is that in many ways the negotiation that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran had with its, uh, with the Americans and the other world powers was based on addressing the apprehensions of the world. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action should have really had no importance at all if the world had taken Imam Khomeini's word uh, uh, at his word that he said that it is not permissible for Iran to have nuclear weapons. It is against what Iran stands for. It is against our religion. Both, both points he had made. But because there was a need to address the concerns of the world, you had a joint comprehensive plan of action. What has happened since then is that a uh, plan that would have kept uh, Iran from going even to a 20% uh, enrichment for another 15 years from, from 2015 to 2030 has now gone. The uh, com Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action no longer operates while Iran continues to insist that if you lift the sanctions, if you come back to negotiations, we will then reverse what we have done and go back to the fact that we will not enrich to 20% Why is 20% important? Because 20% is the, is the key figure at which you can start uh, enriching to the 91 to 93% that you require for a nuclear weapon Second, uh, right now Iran is thinking in terms of bringing back Arak, the, the reactor, and from there, if they set up a plutonium plant, they will be able to extract every year, if they set it up, they do not have a, a plutonium plant right now, but if they set it up, they will be able to manufacture enough plutonium for one or two nuclear devices a year. Now, these are, these are things that we have to bear in mind when we talk about what Iran has put on the table and what Iran is prepared to put back on the table. Now their position has been that Iran must become a normal. They said, there is talk here about the fact that America has offered unconditional talks. This is not true. America's unconditional uh, uh, talks are based on the fact that you meet the 12 conditions that, uh, that have been laid down by uh, Pompeo before you can think in terms of negotiation that Iran must become quote unquote a normal nation before a negotiation. So you know the, the point is that for, for Trump now it has become an article of faith and unfortunately in making this an article of faith that Iran is the villain of the peace he has the support of a very large number of people who nonetheless in, in, in the United States, who in that polarized society still feel that maybe you should follow the rule of law. And he is not prepared to do, do that. Now, with regard to the uh, question of uh, what Iran can do or cannot do in terms of its neighborhood, I think you should bear in mind the fact that Iran has very carefully stated that the only enemy we are trying to attack 
This is the armed forces of the United States of America. That you have, you have attacked the equivalent in your system of the chairman joint chiefs of staff. And our effort is to try and handle, uh, to effect our uh, revenge, if you will, on the American armed forces. This has been sought to be a reassurance to Saudi Arabia, to the Emirates, to uh, Qatar, and all of them, incidentally, are now talking to Iran. It is not, it is not apparent. Uh, there was mention of the fact that Ali Mahdi uh, was, in, uh, in fact, uh, that uh, Abu Mahdi of Mandis and uh, Qasem Soleimani were exchanging messages, that they were bringing messages between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran. I'm not, I'm not sure as to how much of that was really working out, but the point is that that was the intent that they Now, uh, last, last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, the United Nations and the uh, hopes that are attached to the United Nations. Do you know that in the United Nations resolutions on, on uh, the, uh, Iran's nuclear program, there are provisions which say that Qasem Soleimani cannot travel outside Iran. There is a blanket sanction on his travel outside. And of course, they note in their reports every time that Qasem Soleimani goes to, to Syria, and goes to Iraq, and nobody stops him. Uh, but that is the extent to which I'm, I'm trying to tell you that when you look to the United Nations to be effective, they cannot be effective even in this particular regard. This is now, unfortunately, uh, a false hope to entertain that the United Nations intervention will help to bring this about. What they can do is facilitate, but facilitation only happens if there are two agreeable parties. And if the parties are agreeable, then there is a role for the United Nations, which is what is happening in Libya, which is what is happening elsewhere, but they cannot do it on, uh, on their own. I'm sorry, I hope that's addressed part of your question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Ambassador. But uh, as I told, unfortunately, the, sometimes the world is evolving with the media and propaganda. Yeah? The many times the United States want to impose to the public opinion the, their own illegal sanction against Iran is from the United Nations. That you mentioned about the traveling of Mr. Hassan Soleimani outside of Iran, and it is not any relation with the United, United Nations because all of the sanction against Iran is from the uh, unilaterality of the United States. It doesn't have any related with the United Nations, unfortunately. That I mentioned about the saving of the American soldiers. If you remember one, two times, the American during the battle against the Daesh, they sent some message to the Mr. Qasem Soleimani to appreciate him. But right now they are accusing him as a terrorist. Thank you. Can we serve Thank you. I have a question for uh, Ambassador Najbuddin Sheikh. Uh, I just wanted to know what is the role of Israel in the entire episode? Because we saw Netanyahu smiling on hearing of the assassination. You know, you know that President Bush, after 9-11, walked into the office of his counterterrorism chief and said, give me proof that Saddam was behind 9-11. He turned around and said, there is no evidence of this sort. He said, produce it. Why did he say that? Because in attacking Iraq, the objective was what had been spelled out in the blueprint for the 21st century, which was the manifesto for Netanyahu's re-election, in which the whole idea was that there is one Arab country, Iraq, which has the territory and which has the, the population that could make it the center of uh, uh, resistance or of the center around which the Arab countries could coalesce in fighting uh, uh, Israel 
and securing uh, the rights of the Palestinians. So the description of Iraq was, to my mind, part of uh, the election campaign for uh, of Netanyahu, or the, the blueprint that had been drawn up, and that is the implementation of which is what uh, President Bush was looking for. So uh, 2003 was against uh, the interests of the United States, but it was in the interests of Israel. So if you talk about the fact that at that particular stage, and unfortunately since then, Israel has played a major role in the formulation and conduct of American foreign policy. And this has been true through that particular year. This continues, unfortunately, even today. But when you talk about Israel today, Israel is sitting back, resting on its laurels. It's got its positions in Syria. It will attack positions in Syria. It will try to ensure that the passage that currently exists via Syria into Lebanon for Iran should be stopped. That is, that is one of the objectives. He, they believe that uh, Hezbollah uh, in, in, in the Lebanon uh, is something of uh, which would be perhaps weak or and that therefore Hezbollah represents a major danger. They say today that Hezbollah has now has the missiles and other explosive materials which they are constructing now themselves, which is causing damage to, to Israel. So the whole game, uh, if I'm, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, the whole game is that Israel's safety and Israel's pursuit of Judea Samar, that is, of gradual or rapid uh, absorption of the West Bank into Israel. This is, this is the plan which has now been endorsed when they say that those set settlements are not illegal. You can annex, uh, you, we agreed to the annexation of the Golan Heights by Israel. These are, these are all steps that are totally against what uh, the international community stood for and what America stood for, or at least uh, professed uh, loyalty to, that no, uh, there, have, there has to be a two-state solution. That two-state solution is no longer view, viewed as viable. And now it's a question of how you can ensure that there is only one state in Israel, or the West Bank in Israel, and how you can drive the Arabs out so that they do not become the majority. These are the problems that Israel now faces. How do we get rid of them? Push them into Jordan, push them elsewhere, but try and secure total possession of, uh, of uh, the West Bank. And I think that in that they continue to have the support of the United States, both at the government level and largely because of the influence that Israel continues to exercise over the, the political spectrum in, in the United States of America, that Mr. Jared Kushner has still not presented his plan because it is a plan that he thinks now will, will, not, will not be possible to or feasible to push forward at this time because that plan essentially uh, endorses the absorption of the West Bank by Israel. Mr. Berger, would you like to ask a question? My question to Mr. Mohamedi is that uh, could you just give me a broad perspective of what Iran and Iraq's relations are at the moment after the American withdrawal? Of course, the troops are there, but the government is now in the bad election in Iraq. How much influence, or may I use the word control, Iran has over, especially the Shia places in Iraq, and who is actually controlling them? Because I hear from people who go there, there's a lot of Iranian influence there. Am I correct about that? And how do the Saudis see that? That's the other thing. Try to see the neighbor country as a country. The, 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 the Pakistan is Pakistan, Afghanistan is Afghanistan, Iraq is Iraq. Uh, they have their own territory 
and we usually accept and uh, respect them. Uh, as I mentioned, unfortunately, it's a little involving with the media to influencing of the Iran to the Shia group there. If there is any influencing just about the fighting against the terrorism, to help them, Mr. Qasem Soleimani and the, re the remains of the Iranian commander uh, were there as uh, uh, advisor, military advisor by, by the uh, government invitation in Syria too, in, in Iraq too. And uh, I think after the uh, leaving the United States uh, in the Iraq, uh, maybe there is, if, if the government of, of Iraq uh, needs to stay more Iranian advised, military advisor, we can uh, serve them and help them. If they don't want, we do that. Uh, you know that Iraq and Iran uh, such as the Pakistan and Iran, Afghanistan and Iran, because of the common uh, civilization, they have the traditionally have good relation. Until the period of the Saddam Hussein, unfortunately, it has very bad relation and disconnecting and uh, eight years of war against Iran. But uh, usually our presence there just for the this, uh, purposes for the common civilization, for the Atawat Aliyat, you know in the Arbain how many of the people from Iran, from the Afghanistan, from Pakistan, they are going for the Ziyarat Arbain. Yeah, yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying. So where we are heading, this arms race is making this region, even without nuclearization, very unstable and very unsafe. And Iran, of course, willingly or unwillingly, it is part of this race. I want to ask you that the gentleman also mentioned that there is some possibility of olive branch or some peace talk and all that. And our government here in Pakistan also expressed this desire at various levels. So do you th think that any role Pakistan can play or is there any other better option? Somebody talked about the fact that the royal family, the protection of the royal family. But the, uh, the Saudis have made it clear that they see Pakistan as one of the pillars of their defense policy. That we are people that they believe they can depend on to protect them. We, on our part, have made it clear that we would be available to them, uh, with 5,000 troops already there, to ensure that there is internal security. We will not, however, be part of any uh, activity beyond that. Now, this gives us a particular position with regard to both countries of being the honest broker. This has been traditionally our policy. The, uh, uh, since 1947, we followed this policy that if there are any differences between two Muslim countries, we will not take one side, we will not take the other. We will seek to help them to resolve their difference. And at this particular time, it's a very critical time. Uh, that, is the, that was the uh, title of this particular uh, session, uh, that we need to try and see what we can do and to recognize that the principal elements are the countries of the region. And that if we can help the countries of the region to resolve their differences and to ensure that the outside power who has an overweening influence in the region is also persuaded to accept that better relations between these countries are the way for uh, th these countries to be able to set their own houses in order and to be able to move ahead to the be betterment of the region but also the betterment of the world. Mr. Mohammadi, you can have the last word. Thank you. As I uh, mentioned during my speech, uh, usually the Iranian official believes the uh, security is not possible to buy or sell. Security must be have uh, created by the uh, country in the region. Uh, the army race is not accepted for the my government too. You know we have the, some suggestion about the reducing of the uh, 
army race in the region. Uh, many times our uh, foreign minister announced the region is not the army and arsenal stock to buy and to reserve that because in the future it will be very, very dangerous. And uh, we believe usually that all of the country in the region must have the more ally, more cooperation, more integration to create their own security. The paying of the more uh, for the arsenal, for the army equipment, is not shows uh, and not created the security. And Iran and Pakistan, Iran and the other country too, we are ready to have the, this kind of the cooperation, integration between the two countries. That you mentioned right now, we really have the very good uh, relation going and receiving the military delegation. In recent months, we have the many military uh, delegation to go to Iran and come here in Pakistan. And we are ready to follow to and to improve that. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> I was going to make a little speech of my own, but I will not impose it on you anymore because we've uh, quite run out of time. But let me say that we have covered, I think, almost every issue related to the issue which we were discussing. Benjamin Saab focused on the three countries, uh, the United States, Iraq, and Iran. He talked about uh, confusion and polarization in the US, Iran's uh, the economic problems. Uh, he talked about the space which Daesh has acquired through what has happened in that region. And uh, <coughs> Mr. Mohammadi touched upon uh, what a unifying factor this unfortunate killing of General Soleimani has been. He also raised the question of what to do at the regional level, at, uh, within Iran, at the regional level, at the international level. And he also said that the United States, what has emerged is that the United States is not a trustworthy country, not a trustworthy partner, and that it is generally felt that it should quit its presence from this region. And in his rather enthusiastic and uh, slightly unconventional presentation, I think Razanayim came out with, a, with some very interesting ideas. I found them very interesting, especially his reference to the uh, doctrine of maximum pressure by the United States, and especially the doctrine of strategic patience shown by Iran. So thank you everybody for sitting through this session. It has, for me also, it has been a great learning process. I have uh, learned a lot from the wisdom of my former boss, Ambassador Najmuddin Sheikh, and from Mr. Mohammadi, and also from Nazar. Uh, tea is going to be served on the ground floor. Thank you again. Thank you.